Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, uh, a little bit of bio initially. Uh, I have been an obstetrician and I've worked in, I finished obstetrics actually last September and uh, still involved in gynecology and IVF. So I've had a, a lifelong love with uh, obstetrics. Um, did a bit of extra study in 2014 and I feel I'm able to talk about nutrition just like anybody else can. So we're, we're all reasonably expert in it and uh, I'm not sure what gives me a special right other than the amount of time I've had uh, an interest in nutrition in pregnancy and with PCOS and diabetes etc. And I went to the effort of becoming obsessed with uh, nutrition uh, just a few years ago and it was at the time when Gary and uh, Professor Tim Noakes were going through their hard times uh, and I felt absolutely incensed at the idea that APRA could suggest that we could as doctors be operating outside our scope of practice by talking about nutrition to patients. I wrote to them at the time and said come and get me because I do what Gary does every day. Unfortunately, it takes two years to do the investigations and I thought well I'd be retiring by then so I'll be okay. <laughs> <coughs> and I thoroughly enjoyed doing the two courses uh, last year. I call them certificates. Uh, they're certificates of completion. They're not a level three graduate certificate or anything. And I'm presently doing the, uh, the nutrition network uh, at the moment, uh, the next level of it. Now we know, especially from all the work we've heard today from fabulous talks, that the low carbohydrate protocols are being accepted more and more as an option for the management of healthy living or for reversing some of our weight problems or indeed medical conditions. And so my aim or goal today is to discuss low carbohydrate as a nutrition option for the gynecological reproductive related things like PCOS, preconception, pregnancy and gestational diabetes. We'll take a run through these various headings. There's a lot of reproduction going on in Australia, thank goodness, but uh, about 50% of them are unplanned pregnancies. Now this presents itself as a bit of a problem if we truly have an interest in getting people metabolically healthy prior to their pregnancy, getting them on their, checking their immunizations and getting them on supplements etc. And there's a lot of infertility in the country as well with 70,000 IVF cycles between us and New Zealand. Now this uh, presents an opportunity because if a person presents to an IVF clinic it's going to be a few months before they're pregnant and it gives us that opportunity to improve the quality of their gametes possibly uh, by proper nutrition advice, getting them metabolically healthy. So for doctors, especially the general practice, my thoughts are that we should be making nutrition a central component of patient care throughout the life course and I'll expand on that as we go by. Concerns about scope of practice, they have been discussed slightly and probably will be discussed a little bit more. Uh, I think Gary's final statement today was APRA is not going to chase anyone about nutrition advice uh, in any time in the near future. So reproduction in Australia is changing and we are, as pointed out there, growing in age, growing in weight and thinking that that doesn't matter, that we will always have IVF to resort to. Sperm counts have declined dramatically in that short 40 year time spell and as circled up at the top the DNA damage may well be due to many factors but including poor diet and nutrition. We know that uh, overweight status has great impacts on the outcome of fertility and the outcome of pregnancies and also within IVF uh, there is a longer delay to achieving pregnancy, greater dosages of FSH are required and then the responses to FSH uh, and cycles is not just as great. Of course pregnancy itself is littered with various um, uh, complications related to overweight, 
my wife doesn't like me using the word obesity. Um, future generations, and this is one of the important things, it's not just what's going on for the woman who's trying to achieve pregnancy or during her pregnancy, there is an impact on the baby in the uterus. So the baby's future health is uh, in question here. PCOS, 10% of our reproductive age group females have got PCOS, if not more. And there are thin women with PCOS and probably 75% of them have got metabolic abnormality and 95% of those who are overweight. So we know that they've got reproductive problems because they're not ovulating as often. Uh, we know that they've got the metabolic problems of insulin resistance. We know about the psychological impact of all of this, but also again, because of their metabolic ill health, their baby's future health is at risk. The amazing thing that pregnancy is and the adaptations that occur are just phenomenal. In the early part of the pregnancy, insulin levels do begin to rise fairly quickly. Uh, and the whole system is about storing energy. Now, those first few weeks with uh, hyperemesis, etc., a little bit different, but hyperphagia does come on. And it's all about creating the, the adaptations are all about storing energy. And the increased insulin is responsible for that, no doubt. Um, but the last part of pregnancy, when the baby gets very big, the baby is like a, a sponge now, uh, stealing the energy substrates from the mother, and she begins to break down her stored energy through those words that Lucy doesn't like, glycogenol glycogenolysis, <laughs> gluconeogenesis, and lipolysis. And they make the substrates that go across to the baby quite readily to build up the baby and give it a continuous supply of nourishment. Gestational diabetes is when that process gets to the point where the hyperglycemia that's being created in the mother uh, is um, affecting the uh, ability of the pancreas to respond and the, by the blood test parameters we make the diagnosis. And we know from the trial, the HAPO trial from about 10 years ago, that there is no particular threshold of blood glucose that is uh, suddenly associated with poor outcomes for the baby. It is more a continuous line, uh, so the higher the glucose level, the greater the potential for some poorer outcome for the baby. We know that an interesting, interesting point is that mother's insulin doesn't go across to the baby, but mother's uh, glucose level, uh, glucose does, and that crosses the placenta readily, so it goes straight through to the baby, and the baby has to respond to it as we do, as hyperglycemia, and so its pancreas has to produce a whole dose of insulin to, to respond to this with the usual outcomes, which means uh, deposition of stored energy, which is deposition of fat. Um, it is the fastest growing form of diabetes now, gestational diabetes. And as mentioned up there, just in that short length of time since 2012 to 2017, there's been a doubling in the number of registered uh, gestational diabetics uh, with the NDD, NDSS. Everyone, all of the organizations, all of our regulating authoritative bodies tell us that medical nutrition therapy is the first way to go. But what is that going to be? And we'll get into that a little bit. The multidisciplinary team. I think every general practitioner in the audience has got to be scared to death about this. Just in our magazine, the Australian New Zealand Journal of ONG, just this month, has an article written by uh, dietitians lamenting the fact that there's been no increase in the number of uh, gestational diabetics referred to them over the last 10 years. And they're actually pointing out that they are the ones in the guidelines who are meant to be looking after the nutrition advice. It's not true. We are the ones who should be doing this. We should be giving the nutritional advice. It's not like we're talking about every single individual and how many calories are in it and the portion sizes, etc. We see from everything we've done today that it can be an awful lot easier than that. Adequate protein, adequate 
healthy fat and a certain amount of carbohydrate will bring you down into what might be considered a low carbohydrate area, which we will discuss a bit. Should HbA1c be carried out in early pregnancy to pick those who are already hmm, pre-diabetic or diabetic, and yet uh, up to that time not recognized? They do that in New Zealand. And there's a 94% correlation between an abnormal HbA1c and the oral GTT of 26 to 28 weeks. We'll move on to pregnancy and reproduction. Now, a lot of you, like the orthopedic surgeons and uh, others who are here today, will think that their part of medicine is the most important of all. But I'll tell you that pregnancy may well be the most influential and consequential phase in a person's life. Uh, that sentence is from a book by Annie Murphy Paul in 2010, looking at origins. And we'll extend it a little further in a minute to include preconception. <coughs> Anybody in the audience ever hear of Professor David Barker? This man is a phenomenon. You do need to know about him. Uh, he has died now. He was a physician. Uh, but also an epidemiologist. He had a few other traits as well which were outstanding. But he came up with the knowledge that birth weight was associated with poor outcome later on, like heart disease, and expanded it a bit later to include diabetes. And this was just with birth weight records and later records of heart disease and uh, stroke and diabetes and cancer. And an interesting thing about all of that is that he formed what's called the Barker Hypothesis. And uh, it became then known as the fetal origins of disease. And that now has extended to be the developmental origins of health and disease. Because what he was saying was there's something that goes on during the pregnancy that's creating an impact on the baby that is influencing its health later on in life. They've extended it so that it's including preconception. So what they're talking about there is the gametes coming through from mum and dad may be epigenetically altered. Epigenetics is one of the potential ways uh, such that that has an impact on the new little embryo. And then that embryo within the mother is influenced by everything that happens during, during the pregnancy. And I think some of the people here who are really interested in Harvard and Walter Willett and such people might be very interested in this. These people said, we think that might not be right. They're from Harvard. Walter Willett is one of them. Janet Rich Red Edwards, they decided to look at, disprove that hypothesis. And they looked at the 110,000 uh, women from the nurses study. And lo and behold, as Janet uh, Rich Edwards said, there's nothing like the statistics to show you when you have to change your mind, because they showed clearly that what he had said was correct. In their 110,000 women, yes, birth weight was associated with outcomes later in life, the metabolic disorders, the chronic non-communicable diseases that we know about today. The Lancet, if anybody's interested in this, has got three articles, May the 5th last year. They are so well worth reading but they do bring out this point. And if we're talking about preconception and during pregnancy and getting people metabolically healthy, we have got, because of the 150,000 women who reach pregnancy in Australia unplanned, we have got to be looking after their nutrition from the whole life course, really, from earlier in their lives. Metabolic disorders, you've seen a uh, a plot like this from a couple of people today. Um, and the interesting thing about the diseases that I've put in here that are called the chronic non-communicable diseases is that they've all got their own little boxes. So you start there, let's say, with type 2 diabetes. There's a test to be done. There's a, a, a further investigations to be carried out. There's a medication. There's a advice to be given. There's a medication to be given. There's a backup endocrinologist. There's a backup allied health team. All the rest of it. But it's a box, all on its own. You go down to hypertension. It's a box, all on its own. There are investigations to be carried out. There are people you can refer to if this person isn't responding appropriately. There's advice you'll give them about smoking and, and get losing weight. There are drugs to give. 
and it's not related with anything else, but they are all related. All of these things are related to each other through this thing, insulin resistance. And we owe credit to Gerald Raven uh, back in the 80s, I think it was, uh, who brought this information to the world, put it all together. He was dealing with what he called metabolic syndrome, or syndrome X at the time as it was. But what I would like to put to you today is that we know how to manage all of those things now. They don't need their own boxes. They can all be managed to a degree, or a great degree indeed, if we understand metabolic uh, health and proper nutrition for it. And we think we do through lower carbohydrate, healthy fat. And we've got the studies now that show in the general public that low carb, healthy fat nutrition works. There are an awful lot of trials many of them lasting up to two years, and we know it's safe. And I'd like to introduce this idea as well. Overweight, PCOS, gestational diabetes and pregnancy, all these reproductive areas, they're all insulin resistant states. So if we're going to take on our patients now and advise them, hey, what you've got now is probably due to insulin resistance, let's start correcting your, your metabolic health through better nutrition, why aren't we doing it for these? But we don't, and this is what happens. We're told the usual, exercise more, uh, achieve or maintain normal, health, normal weight, and cut out fatty foods, keep your meat, meat lean, <laughs> etc. and make sure you eat plenty of cereals and whole grains. And we've heard it today once or twice. This really now is in the level of being unethical. It's unethical advice. I'll go through it a little bit more in a while. Professor Tim Noakes has made it very clear. If we're giving out that type of advice about cutting fat out of the diet and uh, replacing it therefore with carbohydrate, it is immoral. It's unethical. Nutrition trials have been carried out during pregnancy. There was one from Australia and one from England that I've just shown there, but there are others that show, yes, when a woman is pregnant, you can start trying to influence her nutrition to try and stop her becoming, um, gaining too much weight or tending to develop gestational diabetes or toxemia and large babies. But uh, despite them maybe not gaining as much weight, there has been no great beneficial outcome on reduction of uh, uh, gestational diabetes, toxemia, large for gestational age. But what they were recommending, of course, was the increased consumption of the usual things that we're beginning to turn against somewhat. Interventions before pregnancy do help with fertility, especially with polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, women and with uh, those who are heavily overweight. Uh, one of the studies that I've shown there was from Monash, and uh, there were six low-carb diets that they spoke about, but I put low-carb in inverted commas because low-carb, there was nothing under 170 grams per day. So it's not the low-carb that we're talking about. It is low-carb that crops up in the literature, and when you hear low-carb is no better than dash or than anything else. They're not talking about the low carb that we're talking about. They're talking about hmm, moderately high carb still. And one of our favorite people is Eric Westman. And uh, he had an article as early as 2005 showing that if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, women who are overweight and you bring them down through keto diet, that they will often start ovulating themselves and may not even need the assistance of uh, IVF. We had a gracious moment from the Australian uh, Diabetes Society in August where they put out this paper. I'd love to know what prompted them to put out the paper other than the fact that they were copying the United States a month or two earlier. Was it because a load of diabetics around the country contacted them and said, hey, listen, we've tried this thing and it seems to be working. What's your stance on it? I wonder. But anyway, they did put it out. But look at the rider they had in here for my group of people, the reproductive age group. Low carb eating is not recommended for children. I think Tim Noakes has led the way there, we know that it's okay for children. Uh, pregnant women or breastfeeding women. And look at their reasoning. 
Low carb eating should not be recommended for pregnant women due to the potential folate deficiency resulting, if that's their only reason, then <laughs> that's silly, it's, it's, it's stupidity, it's not good enough at all. These people have put out a tremendously good document and there were Melbourne people and Sydney people involved and Adelaide people. Um, until they started talking about weight loss, obesity and diets. And they showed that obesity will increase insulin resistance, increases PCOS prevalence and exacerbates the clinical features of PCOS and its outcomes. However, there is no diet that they say is any better than any other diet. But again, the diets that they looked at had three meta-analyses and they looked at high protein against low protein, uh, High, uh, high carbohydrate against low carbohydrate. They were not what we talk about. So maybe those studies aren't there and maybe now the research people that we trust uh, need to come up with these. And I'm going to talk for a few minutes on this slide because I think there are loads of flaws and I think we've hit on a couple of them today. The first one is this misunderstanding, as I call it, of George Cahill's starvation experiments in 1968. I've got a slide coming up on it, so I'll just put that aside for the moment. The Institute of Medicine, uh, Lily Nichols, who's one of my favorite authors about pregnancy, uh, she said there were the various institutions all said you've got to have 175 grams at least a day when you're pregnant, but she couldn't find the source. So the closest she got to a source was the 2005 Institute of Medicine statement, and she found they picked 100 grams of carbohydrate and she has no idea where they got that figure, but that was for a man and uh, grams of carbohydrate per day. So they added 35 for pregnancy, that sounds very random. And they added 33 for, brain, for the baby's brain uh, glucose requirements. Came up with 168 but made it 175. <laughs> The Institute of Medicine had another statement that carbohydrate is a non-essential macronutrient as long as there is adequate protein and healthy fat in the diet, and they don't seem to pay attention to this at all. But also, they forget that the body is capable of making glucose itself. If glucose isn't coming in in the diet, the body will make it. There's a persistent belief in the flawed diet heart, hy heart hypothesis. I don't need to go into that very much more other than to say that it is the thing that has influenced all the national dietary guidelines. And our national dietary guidelines are from 2013. The research material that the academic people looked up, they were told, research to 2009. Uh, so it's already 10 years out of date, really. And it is clearly written in the guidelines, these guidelines are for healthy Australians. Well, if you've got one in two adult Australians have got a chronic disease, and one in four have got two or more, and I bet you uh, the general practitioners here will have loads of older people who've got three, four, or five of those <laughs> chronic diseases, who are they making the guidelines for? Um, they're certainly not orientated towards the sicker people with insulin resistance and, however, that's, they're the same guidelines that are recommended by my college, by every other college for people who've got diabetes and overweight, etc. Evidence-based practice was mentioned a little bit today. Evidence-based practice has three pillars. It is the best available evidence, it is the knowledge and expertise of the doctor who's dealing with the patient and it is the goals and aspirations of the patient. But what has happened with these guidelines is that they are being shoved down our throat and they're trying to say evidence this is what you've got to do and it's coming out as guidelines. Uh, again Lily Nichols I'll quote she made a comment and I don't know the source of this but she said when you've got a very good clinical study, it's about 17 years, uh, a study, it's about 17 years before it gets put into practice and it's another several years before it gets into a guideline. Things are changing and they're changing quickly and our patients are searching the internet now. It's not just a quick Google search. There are engineers and uh, computer whiz people who are doing their own PubMed searching and finding that what we've been advising is, is not good and John Ioannides has called them out that um, nutrition 
Science is probably the worst science of all when he assessed it. Um, and the evidence doesn't take account of those 70 clinical trials that I've mentioned. And of course there's a whole dose of ideology, commercial vested interests, conflict and confusions. So going back to the first one, which was this man, George Cahill, in 1968, I think it was, he did uh, what were called starvation experiments. And what he found from sampling the jugular was that prior to starvation, that the brain seemed to need or used 150, 130 grams of glucose per day. But four or five days in, the dietary glucose was gone, the glycogen had gone down, gluconeogenesis had taken over, but even that wasn't giving it all, it, so it was about 50 grams a day the brain was requiring, not 175. And the uh, um, ketone bodies were in fact for his starvation patients, the main source. And these people were, you know, a week or so into the, the thing with perfect mental acuity and mental health. So we don't need the amount of glucose for our brain once we become fat adapted. This nutrition in crisis, that's where I've got this, some of this information from. It's only a couple of months old. Richard Feynman is one of the great biochemists and knowledge in the whole thing to do with nutrition, and that is a fabulous read. So is low carb used during pregnancy? Well, it, it is uh, as an option, and uh, um, I'm sure you've got s some of yourselves or some um, patients who've come into pregnancy in low carb. The diet doctor has, dietdoctor.com, uh, mentioned that they've got loads of people who have contacted them who have been low carb or even keto during pregnancy and happy to continue that way. Uh, Dr. Michael Fox, who Diet Doctor refers to in interviews, uh, he's an endocrinologist in the United States who reckons he's told thousands of women and he believes they continued on low carb. That's not big evidence, but it's happening and it's happening a lot. And Lily Nichols, anybody who's dealing with pregnant women here or potentially pregnant women, you've got to know this girl. She's presently pregnant. Uh, over the United States. We met her in March when we were over there, um, all us uh, down under people who went to the Denver conference. She has got two of the great books. These are delights to read and her YouTube videos are fantastic and include all that knowledge about breastfeeding that may have been asked earlier. They are so worthwhile. It should be in the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists as primary reading. She is a dietitian but she worked at a public, um, public nutrition advice level uh, in California. Keto, uh, the fear of keto, of course, is that muddle about people thinking everything is ketoacidosis if it's keto, whereas in fact there's uh, um, nutritional ketosis and starvation ketosis, which are again two different things to diabetic ketoacidosis. And that came from one study where pregnant women who came in in labor had a urine analysis done which showed ketone bodies in it, uh, or ketones in it, and if it did, it was correlated with some type of IQ test sometime later, and there was a subtle difference between the two. That's the only study, apparently. And ketogenic diets in 2017 for a couple of um, uh, epileptic patients didn't seem to cause any real trouble. So I don't have a whole lot of knowledge here but in that area because it's not there. And there was a recent um, Cochrane study, 2016, which looked at all the various diets, DASH, everything. And the low-carbohydrate diets that they refer to, um, they were, uh, the lowest was 200 grams per day. So they're, they're not useful to us, and yet we know we've got, I think, right on our side to look at this as an option. So challenges are from our patients because they do, as a general practitioner, as an obstetrician, as a lactation person, any, anything at all. We are dealing with people and they range in this spectrum from being vegan to carnivore on the other end. And some of them want to stick with what they're doing. And our response to this has got to be an understanding 
as to, right, you're vegan. Well, I do have some concerns about vegan because of the potential for vitamin K deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, vitamin C, believe it or not, uh, iron, calcium, and a few other things. Now, where are you getting these in your diet, or are you taking the supplements for them? So we, we, if we're going to take this on board, we have got to know how to answer these question, questions. And within the carb protocols, low carb protocols, how do we manage a person who likes to eat once a day, uh, for example? Because a woman who fasts anything more than 12 hours in pregnancy, her ketone level will shoot up fairly quickly. We're worried about the age concerns because they are becoming more overweight and more likely then to have PCOS, diabetes, blood pressure and statin, maybe even management, and all those unplanned pregnancies. So we've got to be able to look at the life course of people. Um, we know, need to know about supplements uh, prior to their pregnancies as well. The information age impact, what I'm talking about here is the thing I mentioned earlier, that people who are doing their own trawling of the internet are finding groups who are doing low carb or keto in pregnancy. And Lily Nichols, whose book I admire so much, she doesn't like uh, fasting and she doesn't like, um, with loads of science behind it in her book, and she, does, she thinks low carb should be, you know, maybe 90-ish, 90 to 150, but certainly not 175 and above. But you may have a patient who you'd like to change their attitude and maybe improve their status. Then you've got to know how to cope with behavior change. And for doctors themselves, um, of course, we're a shockingly resistant bunch. We're loyal as little puppy dogs to the professors that taught us back in university and then in whatever courses we did afterwards in the hospitals. And we don't go to the annual scientific meetings and we never challenge them. They'll be barking down at you still and we need to start learning a bit about critical analysis so we can look at a study and say, well, that's bull. We don't need to follow that rubbish. It's another epidemiological, sorry. <laughs> That's another epidemiolog we've got an epi epidemiologist here who's really good. <laughs> and we've got inadequate nutrition training. We always say that. Well, then we, we, you are starting now if today is your first day doing something on low carb. This, uh, Rod Taylor and his teams and the three uh, general practitioners who have created today, this is fantastic. This is the creation of the nutrition advice, but we're giving it as an option. You're not going to force somebody to do something they don't want to do. And if you're worried about the fact that you don't have much time, do look at David Unwin's uh, video from Low Carb Denver 2019, where he talks about how you might get some of this over in 10 minutes. So we're up to summary time, and uh, I probably don't need to go through it. I've spoken <laughs> about metabolic health pre and post and the opportunities that we should be taking of the life course advice we should be giving to people about nutrition. I've uh, criticized the recommendations because they've got a number of flaws and I've shown that there are some challenges. So can we look at low carb healthy fats during pregnancy? Well, I'd say so. I would advocate uh, as up on the screen, avoid what has been mentioned already today sugar, refined and processed foods, starches and vegetable oils. Get into the fresh stuff, especially if it's from your area. Do not be afraid of fat, uh, healthy fat. And I love this out of uh, a patient who had written into Lily Nichols. I find it ironic that if you tell your doctor that you plan to eat low carb during pregnancy, they say, no, it's unsafe, you can't do that. But if you go back the next week, and you tell them, I plan to eat a diet based on fresh veggies, meat, dairy, fish, eggs, nuts, seeds, and a little fruit. They'll tell you, gee, that sounds good. <laughs> so Lily's advice to us is don't mention the word keto. It'll make the GP and the obstetrician scared. Say you're eliminating sugar, processed, and starchy foods. Thank you very much.